Welcome to History Counts. History provides the roadmap to the future. If you want to know where you're going, you have to understand where you've been. I'm your host, Ken McDermott Rowe. The life of civil rights leader and peace advocate Martin Luther King was ended at the age of 39 by an assassin's bullet. Months after the murder, the authorities proclaimed that the crime had been solved. The murderer, they said, was a lone gunman with unclear motives who acted on his own behalf and no one else's. It was a familiar story, but is it true? Today on History Counts, we take a look at the assassination of Martin Luther King. Who really killed Dr. King and why? Stay tuned to History Counts. Welcome to History Counts. I'm your host, Ken McDermott Rowe. Our subject today is the assassination of Martin Luther King, and our guest is author and international lawyer, William Pepper. Mr. Pepper, who is both a British barrister and an American lawyer, investigated the murder of Dr. King for over a quarter century. For several years, he represented Dr. King's supposed assassin, James Ray, and Ray's legal efforts to obtain a trial. Mr. Pepper later represented the family of Dr. King in a civil wrongful death action against those believed to be responsible for Dr. King's murder. Mr. Pepper is the author of An Active State, The Execution of Martin Luther King. Thanks very much for being with us, Mr. Pepper. Oh, you're welcome. Can you tell us when and where uh, Martin Luther King was murdered? Um, Martin Luther King was, uh, was assassinated in uh, Memphis, Tennessee on the uh, 4th of April, um, uh, 1968, at approximately uh, one minute past six. And why was he in Memphis, Tennessee? He was in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, to organize a march on behalf of the uh, striking garbage workers. Um, they had been um, on, uh, on, on, on on strike for uh, a period of months, and um, it had polarized the Memphis community. Dr. King led a march on the 28th of March, um, which. Uh, broke up into uh, in, into turbulence and violence, and he had to be rushed from the scene. Uh, later, we, we learned that that march was broken up by provocateurs who came from outside of, uh, of Memphis, uh, particularly from uh, Chicago and, uh, and St. Louis. Now, while many Americans think of uh, Martin Luther King principally as a civil rights leader, in the year before he, his death, he started to move into other areas. Can you talk about that? Well, I only knew uh, Martin King the last year of his life, and I came to know him but when I came back from Vietnam. I'd been a journalist in Vietnam, and when I came back, I, I wrote um, one piece in particular that caught his attention uh, and had to do with for Ramparts magazine, and it had to do with the uh, effect of the war on the civilian population of Vietnam, most of whom were either under 15 years of age or or elderly, and uh, they were, of course, being slaughtered. And um, uh, that struck, uh, at, some of my photographs struck him, and so he asked to meet with me, and I worked with him then the last year of his life, and, and began pretty conclusively to, to turn him and see him turn into a more than a civil rights leader. And that had been the direction he'd been heading in any way, but... He now became uh, a, a committed uh, human rights uh, advocate and uh, uh, and an anti anti war campaigner. He made a famous speech at Riverside Church uh, just a year before the assassination. Yeah, one year to the day, in which fourth he, of April, in which he declared his opposition to the war. He was also uh, involved in a poor people's campaign that was going to uh, have a demonstration in Washington that summer. Yes, the he was leaving Memphis, actually, to head into Mississippi and begin the uh, mobilization of marchers into, uh, into Washington, not for the purpose of uh, holding a demonstration and marching, but for the purpose of, of uh, living in an encampment uh, inside Washington, the shadow of the Washington Memorial. Um, so he was going to bring many, many thousands of people there for the purpose of taking up residence in the nation's capital and going up and visiting their Congress uh, people on a daily basis uh, in an effort to try to press them to put back into the budget uh, 
funds that had been taken out and were, were needed for social programs, but had been uh, had been denied uh, because of the war. And there was also some talk that he might run for president in '68. Yes, there was a very distinct movement, and that's that's really what became a major part of my activity. He asked me to head up a national conference for new politics, uh, which was uh, an umbrella organization of all the anti-war and peace activist movements uh, throughout the country, including uh, many uh, uh, sort of uh, dis, uh, disenchanted Democrats, uh, members of the Democratic Party, who who wanted to see this war end. And, and the idea was to form a ticket of uh, Martin King and uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock uh, as a as a third party uh, alternative uh, and on an anti-war platform. You note that in 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations found that the FBI had targeted Martin Luther King since the early 60s. Why was the FBI after Dr. King? Well, I mean, Hoover... Uh, took a, a strong personal dislike to Dr. King, and of course, Hoover was looking for every Hoover was looking for every uh, opportunity he could to tie the civil rights movement and Martin King to uh, communist influence in the Communist Party. Um, this, of course, uh, it was a, an effort to divert, and successfully did for many years, divert attention away from Hoover's alliance with organized crime. And his uh, his working relationship effectively with uh, uh, with organized crime in the United States uh, through being, by being able to deny its existence, which he he did for many many years, uh, and he so he targeted King and um, these activities and other civil rights leaders. These activities included things like burglaries and wiretaps and and infiltration yes, uh, the whole, of the staff. The whole operation, the whole Quantel Pro operation. You mentioned uh, that they even had a, an informant in his executive staff. Yes, they 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 had a they had a, an informant who who uh, was was handled by uh, a, an agent out of the Atlanta field office, and would now subsequent to the the shooting of Dr. King on April fourth, who was arrested for the murder? Well, James Earl Ray was was arrested um, at Heathrow Airport in London. Uh, and charged uh, with the assassination. Uh, he had been well and duly set up, although none of us realized it at the time, and indeed I didn't realize it for nine years. It took me nine years. Nine years later, when uh, Abernathy asked me to go interrogate Ray, uh, that we began to really look at the serious possibility that the man was innocent. How did he supposedly do the crime? Where was he shooting from? Well, supposedly he, um, he he committed the crime from a bathroom window, in a rooming house that backed onto uh, Mulberry Street and uh, the Lorraine Motel, and supposedly, allegedly, he had rented a room, uh, and he uh, just waited for Dr. King to appear, and then he he shot him uh, and and fled. Uh, down the stairway and out the front door, uh, where he went a few feet uh, south on Main Street, dropped the bundle in a in the doorway of a uh, of an amusement parlor and sh- record shop, and then got into a Mustang, drove away. Now that was the story that that of the actual killing uh, that the government put forward. And he did plead guilty uh, subsequently. He um, he was coerced by. His second lawyer, Percy Foreman, who had promised him a trial, but at the end of the last minute, uh, coerced him into pleading, uh, into into copying a plea, saying they were going to uh, fry him. The media had already, the media had already convicted him that uh, his family would be harassed forever. Um, and uh, but the main reason James told me that he finally decided just. The plea was formed and said, look, my health is not good, and I can't give you my, your best defense. So just take this plea and then hire another lawyer, set it aside, and, uh, and you'll be much better off. Did Ray recant his plea? Oh, sure, 
Sure. He always, I mean, he, he, he never actually said that he did it. He, uh, he accepted legal responsibility in a series of check stipulations. Um, and, and, and James had uh, three days after, uh, three days after the sentencing hearing, um, he moved to set aside his, uh, his guilty plea and, and to seek a trial. Although the government claimed that Ray had uh, committed the murder by shooting from a bathroom in a rooming house, uh, several witnesses, you point out, uh, saw, appear to have seen gunfire coming from a, a bushy area instead. Yeah, well, the, yeah that's right. The, the, the area behind the, the rooming house, which is now, by the way, a museum, but the area behind that rooming house was, was overgrown with, with bushes and brush and um, just just a, a massive amount of under, undergrowth there. And that's where the sniper actually lay in wait. And yes, he was seen by, uh, by a number of people who independently uh, reported seeing. In addition, uh, during the course of your representation, uh, a judge ruled that uh, the gun, uh, the rifle that he allegedly used, had not been sighted? Yeah, it had not been sighted in, and it was off both to the left and too low, so it could not have been used uh, in that murder. And in addition to that, of course, the state could not match uh, any, any test fires from that rifle to the, to the death squad. Now, the rooming house was uh, above uh, a grill owned by a man named Lloyd Jowers, and in 1993, uh, Mr. Jowers made a request for immunity to the Tennessee Attorney General. Can you talk about what he admitted to doing? Yeah, Jowers um, initially just started off by uh, admitting that uh, he had been involved in a conspiracy, uh, in the conspiracy to kill Dr. King, and he asked for immunity. He wasn't a good citizen. I mean, it's not something he did uh, voluntarily of the goodness of his heart. We had uh, a number of witnesses, uh, independent witnesses, who uh, tied Lloyd Jowers to this killing. So he thought this was a bit up. He didn't know that he was going to uh, not be indicted, and so he thought he would. He'd asked his lawyer to uh, to get immunity for him. And what was his involvement uh, with respect to the rifle, with respect to the funds that may have been used for the assassination? Well, Jowers received a hundred thousand dollars in a delivery box, in a vegetable delivery box, which was rooted to him by. Uh, uh, Frank Liberto, uh, who was a, uh, a lieutenant in the Carlos Marcello organization, and um, he, um, he he received that money in his grill called Jim's Grill. His role was to um, accept and hold on to the murder weapon for uh, a, a brief period of time, and then it was to basically be out in the back. Bush, Bush's area, and to take the uh, take the weapon from the shooter, which he did. And as he burst into the back of the kitchen uh, with a still smoking rifle, there was uh, uh, Betty Spates, who had been his mistress for a number of years, who was, had come looking for him. And she saw him rush by her, holding this gun, break it down, and wrap it into a towel. But she heard that only only moments after uh, she had heard the rifle shot. She was standing inside the kitchen. She heard the rifle. Now, he also made admissions to uh, Dexter King and Andrew Young, not just about uh, the money and the rifle, but about planning sessions that occurred in Jim's Grill involving uh, Memphis Police Department personnel. Can you talk about that? There were planning sessions in the grill. It involved a number of police officers in the Memphis Police Department, and, um, and, and Jowers, uh, Jowers admitted that they took place. So he was fully involved in this. Operation. The uh, uh, the Memphis Police Department failed to undertake certain uh, security measures you mentioned uh, when Dr. King came to Memphis uh, on April 4th, uh, including depriving him of his usual security guard of black detectives. Yes, there was usually a, a group of, of detectives, um, uh, four poor black detectives who had always uh, watched out for Dr. King when he... Uh, when he came to, uh, to Memphis. And in this instance, they were not formed. You also mentioned that the uh, emergency tactical police units were pulled back from the Lorraine Motel, and uh, oh. that, curiously, two black firemen 
assigned to a firehouse overlooking the Lorraine were told not to report. Yeah, there were the, the TAC-10 unit that had been stationed at the Lorraine was pulled back to the fire station, to the firehouse, which is on the corner of Mulberry and um, stretches up, up to South Main Street. They were pulled back there out of the area, um, the immediate area. Um, the two, two uh, uh, a black firemen were uh, instructed not to not to show up that day. They uh, they were removed from from duty. That's right. And it's not clear why Dr. King was assigned a room with a balcony. His room was supposed to be uh, down below, uh, in an in an alcove area, and um, uh, they switched his room, uh, may virtually at the last minute, and put him up in room 306, which was the balcony room over overlooking a uh, uh, the swimming pool, which, of course, was not in, in use. In a, but he was in an ideal, uh, ex- ideally exposed position for the assassination. Now, who was Frank Liberto, uh, the man who gave Jowers the $100,000? Frank Liberto, um, uh, who, who made the, uh, arranged the funds, did, did not himself give them to him. He had them at, by a delivery person. Frank Liberto ran a, uh, a food wholesale warehouse uh, outside of uh, outside of downtown Memphis, and he was um, was Marcello's man in uh, in Memphis. Very close connections uh, with the police department because they were very much involved in illegal gambling and prostitution and drug running, uh, the usual the usual uh, mob activities, and uh, they needed uh, protection, which they got. And uh, Liberto um, uh, was the the guy who was assigned to carry out a lot of the work on the ground in terms of organizing the assassination. Now, a man named John McFerrin uh, uh, gave evidence about a phone call that he heard uh, just before uh, the assassination, to be on April 4th, around 4.45 or 5 o'clock. Can you talk about uh, what Mr. McFerrin says he heard? He owned a small grocery store and gas station up in Somerville, about an hour from Memphis, and he um, uh, would shop once a week at, uh, at Liberto's warehouse and uh, pick up his wholesale products, and he was in there uh, on the day of the assassination, on April 4th in the afternoon, about an, about an hour, an hour and a half before the killing, and um, at one point when he was in the store, he heard Liberto on the telephone screaming into the telephone, uh, uh, shoot the son of a bitch when he comes out on the balcony and don't bring your ass around here, go down to New Orleans and get the rest of your money from my brother. Tell me about a man named Raul and what involvement he had. Well, Raul was uh, James's handler. James had always said that he had a handler and his name was Raul. Um, and he was, he'd been treated as some sort of fanciful figure, but we've pretty much established that, uh, that he, who he was and, and the fact is that he, he did handle it. He was James's handler. He did, did meet him in a, in a bar up in, uh, in Montreal as James was trying to leave the country. Remember, James was an escaped convict, and he was on the run trying to leave the country. And this guy, there certain people had been helping him uh, and steering him toward the Canadian docks in Montreal, and he was in this bar, and that's where this fellow Raoul effectively picked him up, made contact with him, offered him a job, uh, offered to buy him a car, and uh, wanted to keep him on a string for making certain deliveries for him and running errands, at the end of which he promised him he would get him to get travel documents for him. Did Raul have anything to do with getting a, a rifle to, uh, to, the, uh, to the grill? Yeah, I mean, Raul, um, of course, designated the rifle that James was to buy, and when James bought the wrong rifle. Uh, he, uh, Raoul sent him back. This was in Birmingham to buy a, a 30 odd six, which he didn't buy the first time. So, and then Raoul met him the night before the killing. He met him at the uh, New Rebel Motel, uh, just outside of Memphis, and took the rifle away from James. That was the last James saw the rifle. The rifle, that rifle, was the throwdown gun that was found in Knipe's doorway. I see, and then another gun was actually used for the the assassination. Oh yes, no, yeah, that 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 was just a throwdown gun. Now, now Raúl uh, connects to Carlos Marcello 
through a, a gun running operation that also connects the, the U.S. military. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that was an interesting, um, almost convoluted connection. Um, around this time, there were a number of military bases and forts and uh, that were being uh, being looted of weapons, of armaments. And they were being often driven into Marcello's um, place uh, on the uh, on the water, and uh, put on a flatboat, shipped around into Houston, unloaded in Houston, repackaged by a team there. And Raúl was part of that team, repackaged by a team there. In fact, this Raúl led the team, uh, and then they were then they were so being sold into. Um, uh, Latin and South America. Two of the people who drove to the to the, the the grunts soldiers who drove the truck with weapons in were a part of the sniper unit that was really coincidental. The sniper unit that was in uh, in Memphis as a backup unit. Well, now could you talk about the uh, the nine oh second military intelligence group and uh, in general what the the uh, U.S. military domestic spy operations that uh, they were involved in in the uh, in the years preceding the assassination? Well, I think the, the military has been far more active and involved in domestic espionage and surveillance on American citizens than has ever been revealed. When Ramsey Clark would not sign a uh, would not would, would not sign an authorization for wiretapping on Dr. King and his residence and his church and so forth, uh, Hoover then went to his buddies and the in military intelligence under uh, Bill Yarborough, who uh, was the assistant chief of staff for intelligence, uh, and they had they had the military uh, involved in the surveillance of Dr. King. So it was very it was a very extensive operation. Uh, the the uh, deuce was right in the middle of all of it. You mentioned that the 902nd uh, was deployed in small units uh, throughout uh, 67 and 68 and that they carried mug uh, books of black leaders. Yeah, that's what I was told, that uh, they had small um, small units, uh, often sniper units, and they carried mug books of, of community leaders who were uh, deemed hostile and uh, and to be uh, neutralized in one way or another. Now, uh, now some, some of your information about the 902nd and the military involvement of the events of April the 4th comes from a man named Warren? Those are pseudonyms. Uh, Warren and Murphy are pseudonyms um, to protect. I try to protect people who are still alive and certainly people who tried to provide us with information and help us. They're out of the country, but uh, and, and they provided information. They, they were members of the sniper unit. They provided information through Steve Tompkins, who, um, the same journalist who became aware of their presence in Memphis. Now, you say that Warren was a member of something called Alpha 184 Team. Can you talk about the activities of the team on April 4th? It was an eight-man sniper unit that, that left uh, uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and drove, uh, left at about 5.30 in the morning and drove into Memphis. And various members of the unit took up their appointed positions. And um, their task was, so they thought, was to take out Andrew Young and Martin King. And Andrew Young was a bit of a surprise, but they had two sniper units, two sniper teams, and one of them, the one on top of the railroad building, was to take out um, Andrew Young. And um, that, they thought, was their job. And they were in position and ready to go. And then what happened was the... Um, uh, the sniper, it was a civilian sniper, um, and they were the backups, in my view, to that civilian sniper. The civilian sniper uh, uh, fired from the bushes and accomplished the task, and so they uh, they were not needed. They were told to uh, disengage and withdraw. Now, the King, the King family in 97 uh, came to support uh, James Ray's uh, legal uh, maneuverings for a trial. Uh, what what was the result of that? Well, um, we had there were two trials that one can say connected with this whole thing. One back in '93, which related to um, evidence that we had at the time 
and it was actually a television trial, but it was unscripted, and it was bitterly fought with an independent jury and a former federal judge presiding. Um, and that took that, with the minimum of evidence we had at that time, it took that jury seven and a half hours to find James not guilty, which was a shock to Hickman Ewing in particular, who was the prosecutor. Uh, and had former U.S. attorney in Memphis and former, uh, later to be a Ken Starr uh, prosecutor against Bill Clinton. Um, so that was that was one. Then, and that, by the way, opened the floodgates to a lot of information that we didn't have. That started coming. Okay, the second trial, the one to which you're referring, was the civil trial, which was an actual civil trial. So you chose a civil route. Then. It was the civil route whereby the King family would sue Lloyd Jowers and others, including agents of the United States and agents of the state of Tennessee and the city of Memphis, for a conspiracy to kill Martin King. Jowers was the key defendant in that trial. Did they seek damages, monetary? No, they only sought, well, they did, but only to the extent that, um, only to the extent that it was required to pay the burial cost. And that trial, the equivalent of the burial cost. And that trial uh, took place in uh, 1999 in uh, Memphis. Yeah, it took place in 1999 in Memphis, and it lasted for 30 days. Had 70 witnesses, probably never before in history. Have has an assassination been so well uh, documented and detailed under oath? And what was the jury's verdict? Uh, the jury found for the King family that a conspiracy existed, and um, took them 59 minutes. And they, they only attributed 30% of the responsibility to Lloyd Jowers, and the rest they attributed to the government. So they they, they, dis, they determined that Lloyd Jowers participated in the conspiracy, but that others, including government agencies, also consp- uh, oh, sure. participated. Yes, absolutely. And what was the media's reaction to the verdict? Um, silence. The media's reaction to most things has been silence. There was one article uh, in the New York Times, and then it went away. Um, the media stayed in the hallway through most of the trial, not hearing the evidence. When Mrs. King testified, or Andrew Young, or Dexter, they they came in, took note of that testimony. But when the real hard evidence was being presented, they were for the most part not not capable, not not willing to report it. So uh, the American people, most American people, don't even know the trial took place. Well, thanks very much for being with us, Mr. Pepper. You're listening to History Counts, and we've been talking about the assassination of Martin Luther King with attorney William Pepper, author of An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King. This is Ken McDermott Rowe, host of History Counts. One should not underestimate the effect that political assassinations have had on the course of history. If Martin Luther King had lived, how might have American history changed? Would race relations have evolved toward integration rather than black power? Would blacks and whites have made common cause in the labor movement? Would the Vietnam War have continued for another seven years? Thank you for joining us. History Counts is produced by MDR Productions, Inc. and engineered by David Schwartz. Please visit us at historycounts.org, where you can listen for free to an archive of this program and others. Until next time, this is Ken McDermott-Rowe for History Counts.